was born in Mancus, Colorado, which is a very small town down near Mesa Verde National Park, which is in the Four Corners area. And we lived in Colorado until 1937. At that time, my father uh, took employment with the Soil Conservation Service, and we moved out here to Oregon, which was far away at that time. And we came to the Dalles. And we were there for a short while, and then uh, moved up to Condon, which if people don't know where that is, it's about 50 miles south of Arlington in central Oregon. We lived there for a short while, and even though it was just a few months, I made lifelong friends, which was you know, typical of Eastern Oregon people, I think. From there, we went to Pendleton, and I graduated from high school there. Then came down to Oregon State after working a couple of years, because I needed to earn some money <laughs> to go to college. And uh, I went to Oregon State for almost two years. And that takes us up to October of 1945. I hope that was right. Anyway, the war was over, and I met this very nice fellow who had just come home from uh, the war. He had been in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, was captured on Bataan. And in March, the following March, we were married, March of uh, 1946. We lived in Corvallis, and uh, he went on and got his master's degree there. Then from then on, I don't want to go into all that detail, but we did move up here to, to a farm south of Turner in the Cloverdale School District. And that was where I met uh, Margaret Miller, who worked for then Senator Eddie, or he was a representative, Representative Eddie Ahrens. And we had known Walter Leth for some time through uh, the School of Agriculture in, in Carvallis. And farm prices were not good at that time, so uh, we needed money. <laughs> and fortunately, I was able to uh, get a job here at the Capitol. Crops and farm prices had hit bottom. In the meantime, we had, we had four young children. One was just a few months old. And so uh, in 1955, when the legislature convened, I was given the opportunity to come to work here. And it was through Senator Walter Leth. He was from Polk County. And uh, I worked, went to work for the chief clerk of the Senate, which was the title at that time, Mrs. Silpha, Silpha Zell Burns. I have to be careful saying that. And she was from Portland and a taskmaster. but. Um, it was in the office right back of the Senate here is where I started. And Elmo Smith was governor, which was fun. Mrs. Burns taught me a lot. Uh, first of all, it was protocol and manners in the Senate. And never in the world would I have called a senator by his first name. It was senator. and. Elmo Smith was Mr. President, and that has stuck in my mind ever since. Well, my work in the Senate started in 1955. I worked the 57 session for Mrs. Burns, and then in 59 and 61 sessions, I worked for uh, Representative Robert L. Elstrom. He was a representative from Salem and uh, I worked as his secretary on the floor of the House. And that was a very interesting experience because um, there were no, no wings, no offices, and we sat at the desk of the representative. I had my half, he had his half, with his pipe and all the tobacco that goes with it. <laughs> and uh, our files were in a drawer right down to our right. And I don't know how we managed, but we did. And uh, as for 
uh, using a typewriter or writing letters. There was a room off of uh, the house chamber and there were typewriters set up in there and you went along with 60 other secretaries and tried to get a typewriter. But after session was over, uh, I would go up and use the press typewriters. The press was located right, right by, the, by the house desk up in front and they would leave and there would be their typewriters. So I would walk right up there and get a typewriter. And, uh, and it was fun. And uh, the floor was open to anyone except a half hour before session and a half hour after session. But the lobbyists came in and made themselves at home. And when they came in, I got up and left. <laughs> but uh, it was fun. Then back in, then in 1961, I think it was, I came back over here to the Senate and worked uh, in the Secretary of the Senate's office. And as I recall, that's when the title was changed to Secretary of the Senate. And a man by the name of Dale Henderson was Secretary of the Senate. And Harry Boyvin was president. And that was fun and interesting. And then I've been in the Senate ever since. It was clerical work, typing, letters, uh, getting things ready for session, and uh, taking care of the bills when they came in. Then, of course, after session, we did not have, it was not year-round employment at that time. There was revision, which is uh, gathering all the records together and getting them ready to publish, and what was then the calendar. and. Uh, and of course the Senate Journal. Then after that I went to an interim committee, which was probably the Highway Committee as I recall. I was appointed Secretary of the Senate in January of 1976 by Jason Bowe, who was president, and then elected in, uh, in January of 1977 at the 77 session. Cecil Edwards, who followed Dale Henderson as Secretary of the Senate. He, uh, he retired was, is the bottom line, but I had worked for him all of that time, and he, uh, he was my mentor. And he recommended to Senator Bo that I be appointed Secretary of the Senate. And I'm indebted to Cecil. I learned a lot from him. He was a very interesting interesting man. He was fortunate to have worked for him. Well, Elmo Smith was president when I first came. And during the time that he was president of the Senate, and it was during the interim, Paul Patterson was governor. And he uh, was in Portland, getting ready, planning his campaign, had a heart attack and died. Well, at that time, the president of the Senate succeeded to the governor's office, to the governorship. And so Elmo became governor. And then, in the night, and during the 1955 session, and I, you know, it's hard for me to remember all of this, but there was a big tax bill. And in the 55 session, there were only five Democrats. The rest were Republicans. Well, as a result of this tax bill, in the 1957 session, the Democrats control. <laughs> well, no, it was a, it was a, an even split, 15-15, and so there was this long procedure of choosing, of electing a president of the Senate, and uh, that's when the coalition was formed. And Boyd Overhulse, who had come over from the House, he was a first-term senator. He was the compromise between the Republicans and the Democrats for the presidency. He was a lawyer from over at Madras and a very nice, calm, easygoing man. And I think it was just what we needed at the time. And I can remember him saying at the end of the session that uh, one of the things he was most proud of is that none of his rulings had been appealed, which was a tribute to the man. Senator Pearson was president in 59 and I was over in the House. 
Senator Boyvin was president in 61, and I was in the House. I came back here in 63. Senator Musa from the Dalles was president. He was an accountant. And uh, something unusual about that, his wife was a representative, which was unusual at that time. And there were some of the Senate senators and maybe the Senate wives <laughs> who thought that, you know, there was kind of a conflict of interest there. I doubt it, but it was a topic of conversation. Then Senator Boyman was president again in 65. He was fun. He was very unique. And he had the nickname of the Fox, and it was well put. He could, he, he never went the direct route. He always went around. And he would, I would laugh at Cecil because he always had to go and talk to the president before the session. Well, Senator Boyvin, he came in about 10 minutes at 10. <laughs> and you could hear his heels clicking on the, the floor was not carpeted then, it was marble. You could hear him coming and Cecil would run, get the hold of Senator Boyvin. And this was all coalition. The Republicans still had a lot to say. Senator Potts was president in 67 and 69, and I'll talk more about him later. Then in 1971 was another very interesting year in that um, the coalition still pretty well controlled things. And the Republicans, I can't remember just what the division was then, but they had quite a few. Well. I think Senator Potts would have loved to have been president again, but it didn't work out. Senator Bud Lent from Portland, a Democrat, wanted to be president. It ended up after, I can't tell you how many days, maybe weeks, maybe a couple of weeks. Anyway, John Burns was elected president in 1971. He was only 34 years old at that time, a lawyer from Portland. but. He was a native of Condon, which is another, which <laughs> makes another connection of Con to Condon for me. And once you've been in Condon, you're always a friend of whoever is from there. He served and he did well. Then in 1975, Jason Bow came in as president. He had been minority leader over in the House and uh, you know, they say cream rises to the top, and Senator Bow certainly did. He was president for three terms, and uh, a joy to work with. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And he, he had such a nice way about him in uh, managing the Senate and, and the senators. And Senator Potts was a big help to him. Senator Potts was wonderful at um, talking to the members and getting them to compromise, I guess is a good way to say it. But uh, I know when uh, Senator Bo needed help, Senator Potts was the first one he called. Following Senator Bo was Senator Hurd, who had been majority leader. Then Senator Fadley. And in 1985, John Kitzhaber became president. And I have him here for four sessions, which I think is right 85, 87, 89, and 91. And 93 was Senator Bradbury. I resigned or retired in 19. In January of 89, so that was after that. You know, I just read about it in the paper. It was Senator Bradbury, and in 1995 was Gordon Smith. After that, you know the history. <laughs> I think it differs with the leadership, with who the Senate president is. Uh, Cecil was uh, not only Secretary of the Senate, he was really he advised the president of the Senate. Sometimes presidents took it and sometimes they didn't, but he really uh, 
could fill them in on the on past history, legislative history. That was not my role. My role was uh, clerical in that we keep the journal, we keep the calendar, and the official record of the proceedings, that is foremost. It's a constitutional officer, I, sh I should add that. And we are elected, the, Sen the Secretary of the Senate is elected by the body. Uh, and I'm sure it's at the recommendation of the President of the Senate, because there is a close relationship there. From the time that I became Secretary, it was a full-time position, year-round position. You uh, hire the pages and the floor staff. And at that time, we worked closely with committee staff. The assistant secretary that I had 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 previous experience down in engrossed in roll bills, and she was very helpful to committee staff on how their reports should come in. And of course, at the end of the session, we follow through with revision and printing the journal and the final calendar. And in the meantime, you know, there's always a special session, it seemed like. And in the 1977 session, I believe it was, the Senate passed a bill, or not passed a bill, it, it would have been a, a resolution to uh, consider executive appointments during the year and not have it wait until session began. So following the 77 session, we met periodically to approve the executive, the governor's executive appointments. That was another, you know, procedure that we devised and helped with. Olus was becoming more and more important to our operation and there was always something new <laughs> with computers, doing away with one and getting another one or some procedure and so we pioneered that really. But uh, the Secretary of the Senate is an officer of the Senate and uh, which is a privilege and uh, at that time, we had a lot to say about what went on in the Senate chamber, if there were any activities in between sessions. At that time, Girls State met. There must have been some other organization that I can't remember right now, but that was a big thing. <laughs> it was frustrating at first, and I never became that proficient. But I had a wonderful staff, and they became experts. It did make the job easier, and uh, it changed our procedures at the desk immeasurably. We had uh, computers out at the desk, which never would have happened before. And uh, you know, it was amazing how quickly we could get the information into the computer and get it printed. And during the last days of session, I remember so clearly my calendar clerk, who was Kathy Eustrom, she was so fast on the computer that by the end of the session, she had all the entries made, and that was remarkable. We had never dreamed of anything like that, but it was wonderful. And of course, you know, did away with a lot of proofreading. My gosh, I can't, you know, I grew up proofreading, I think. You know, from the time I came in the Senate doors, I was just so impressed. And then to be able to work, for Mrs. Burns in the chief clerk's office. I had no idea of becoming secretary at that time. But the longer I worked for Cecil, and uh, the more that he taught me, then I wanted to become secretary of the Senate and hoped I could do a good job. And so when he approached retirement, and very kindly he uh, promoted me to uh, Senator Bow. And I had a good relationship with Senator Bo as well, but, uh, you know, just being here, I loved it. I still do. Well, of course, it was taxes and education and the bottle bill, the beach bill. And one item that came up during the 59 and 61 sessions was the Astoria Bridge. Bill Holmstrom was the uh, representative from Astoria, and he 
almost alone, promoted that bridge, no one thought that it would ever pay for itself or work, and it was a bridge to nowhere. And look at it. <laughs> I mean, it's been a huge success. But Bill Holmstrom is the one who's, who's responsible for that. Of course, he got a lot of help, but uh, I don't think anyone but him would have <laughs> would have had the courage to, to promote it like he did. And then, of course, there's uh, executive appointments is now, the approval of executive appointments is now in the Constitution. And uh, another thing that came about was following the 1971 session, and I want to speak, I have an anecdote about that later, but uh, at that time, the president of the Senate was successor, or, or you know, went to the governor's office. And if the governor was out of state, the president of the Senate went to the governor's office. And we operated with 29 senators, which was a controversial thing at times, very controversial. Well, following that session, there was a petition put out to the people that made the secretary of state the successor, or to succeed the president, or to succeed the governor. And of course now, you know, with all the communication that we have, I doubt that, that that's in effect any, you know, I'm, I'm sure the Secretary of State doesn't go up there and be the governor when Governor kulongoski is gone, but at that time, John Burns went into McCall's office and he was, he was governor. And Senator Potts was governor at times, and it was fun. I want to say, <laughs> but he had all the powers of the governor too. And one of them, it wasn't it wasn't Senator Burns. I think it was Senator Potts did something about some prisoner on parole, <laughs> but he had the authority to do it. And I I can't remember what it is now, but anyway, that was it. I think those are the main things, the same things we're talking about now. Well, Senator Potts for one, and, and Jason Bowe for sure. I think he was outstanding, and he put the legislature on its feet. He really, through his uh, association and president of NCSL, he made the legislature the third branch of government and made people take up and sit up and take notice. Also, of course, John Burns, who uh, he had a difficult time, but uh, and I and I think in retrospect he enjoys it, enjoyed it, but it was a new experience for him. And another prominent senator was Senator Aturi. He was a Basque, the first Basque in the Senate. He was from Ontario. A very personable, bright man, and he was in the Senate for a long time. I think you should know some of the important people who were in the Senate at the time that I worked here, and who've gone on to greater things. First of all, Senator Carson, the Supreme Court Justice. Senator Lent was a Supreme, became a Supreme Court Justice, and so did Ed Fadley. And I think Betty Roberts went to the Supreme Court. I couldn't remember whether it was the Supreme Court or Court of Appeals, but is it the Supreme Court? And Vicatia became governor. John Kitzhaber became governor. Mike Thorne, who uh, was in the Senate for several sessions, became director of the Port of Portland. And Barbara Roberts, while well, she was not a member of the Senate, she was very much a part of Senator Frank Roberts' staff, very, very much involved with him. And of course, Senator Aturi, he went on to, became, to become chairman of the, of the Transportation Commission. And uh, it was fun. I was through Ontario not too long ago, well, a couple of a year ago, I guess. And we were just, I was with my brother and his wife, and we were driving along, and. Here is Anthony Aturi Memorial Boulevard, <laughs> just out there like that. It was fun, brought back lots of memories. Another 
graduate from the Senate is Governor Ted Kulingoski. He served in the House first, and then uh, I'm not quite sure of uh, just what happened in what order, but he also was the director of a state agency, then came to the uh, Supreme Court and was a justice for several years before he became governor. So we have another prominent member of our society who was a member of the Senate. And it was fun to know him. He was active uh, in the Senate and Labor Committee and related things like that. But uh, it's nice to have known him and certainly fun to watch all of the comings and goings from the governor's office. But they were really, you know, distinguished people. Distinguished people. And, of course, several of them were lawyers, which is kind of a, at that time, was a natural thing. And I remember, I can't remember which session it was, but it was later, that we didn't have enough lawyers to fill the Judiciary Committee. Now, I'm sure that there are a lot of members of the Judiciary Committee who are not lawyers. Senator Turi, I should mention, he was chairman of the Criminal Law Revision Commission, which really uh, wrote the law on criminal law that's in effect now, as far as I know, unless something's been done to it since. One that was interesting, and, and I wanted to review this with you, it was when John Burns was president, and uh, Governor McCall was out of state. Well, of course, Senator Burns went into the governor's office. And the Democrats were really quite upset with him for accepting this office of presidency because Senator Lent was their candidate. Well, anyway, Senator Burns went into the governor's office, and uh, Senator Boyvin was the president pro tem. So he got up and the rostrum and appointed, and he was also chairman of the Elections Commission Committee. He got up and appointed three more members to the election committee, Elections Committee, and they had a meeting, and they passed out a bill on the 18-year-old vote. And at that time, the Senate shut down. <laughs> Governor McCall came back. Senator Burns came back. And uh, truthfully, we were told to go home from the desk, not to accept any bills. And so the Senate closed down. And so finally, uh, some kind of an agreement was reached. Senator Burns was back as president. And uh, he removed those three members from the committee. The bill came out of committee, and who carried it on the floor but Senator Burns, and it passed. <laughs> but it was, it was tense, it was exciting, and it was fun <laughs> looking back on it. And we were so careful that the journal <laughs> did put everything in it just, just like it happened. <laughs> but that was an interesting thing, and I'm sure there were others. But one. Thing I must mention that's a fun thing. The first session I worked here, I was just a little girl off of the farm. And I came in here on St. Patrick's Day. And I had never seen anything so pretty. There were green carnations all over. Every member had a carnation. Every desk had a green carnation. There was even green water in the water coolers. And we had songs and music and it was, it was wonderful. <laughs> I had never seen anything like it. Some of the senators had very good voices, and we had a quartet, and they would get up and sing. And it was Bob Holmes and Lowell Steen from Pendleton, and I can't remember the other two. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a wonderful performance. <laughs> well, uh, this was following the 1955 session probably in the year 56, one of the big matters for discussion was to increase the number of members on the Highway Commission. At that time, there were three members, and uh, they had a 
a Cadillac, sort of like a limousine, at their disposal to travel around the state to check highways and check where highways were going to be built. And uh, one of the running jokes at that time was, well, we can't have five members on the commission. We only have room for three in this car. And so, <laughs> of course, that was a joke and nothing serious, but it was fun at the time. And uh, we had a, but uh, this car was very nice for that time. It had two jump seats and, of course, no member of the Highway Commission would want to sit in the jump seats. <laughs> but uh, finally, I think the following session that the uh, commission was increased to five members, and that represented the five districts in the state. I don't think the Highway Department necessarily wanted more members. Mr. Ball Sam Baldock was the highway engineer at that time, and he was a very formidable man, rather small and of small stature, but he ran the highway department. And uh, if you'll notice, the rest area between here and Portland is named the Baldock Rest Area. And also, I think it still stands at I-84 between Portland and Eastern Oregon probably. It used to be called the Baldock Highway. He was very influential, very innovative and creative and the highways department was a dynasty all, all its own. It was certainly one of the nicest office buildings in this campus. And uh, it was a pleasure to, to work with those people. They were all professional and uh, the right of way division, the whole thing was a very, very pleasant experience. Senator Burns was president. And I don't know what Senator Mahoney did but Senator Burns banged the gavel down and broke it. <laughs> and of course, you know, it just, the whole Senate just laughed and that took care of it. <laughs> but it was funny. I remember, was this Senator from Grants Pass? He was a young guy and he succeeded Senator Potts. Can't remember his name right now. But anyway, he was in some sort of trouble down there. And here was this KATU camera over on the side aisle. And Senator Kitzhaber was present then. He got the sergeant at arms to go and get that camera off of the floor because there was no reason to embarrass, to further embarrass this senator from Grants Pass. And I thought, you know, it was such so considerate and such quick thinking on Senator mm -hmm. Kitzhaber's part to get that taken care of. Mm -hmm. adding, adding the Senate and House wings and office space for the members and staffing for the members, that was the first time that they were permitted to have a legislative aide and a secretary. But also in that period, was the establishment of the fiscal office, the revenue office. Prior to that, legislative council came first. That was the first office that was uh, then, and then followed by legislative administration. And that, of course, you know, reorganized the legislature, really. And uh, uh, I think that the committee staffing with professional people has been one of the most beneficial things. And that came mostly after I left. It, it had begun when I was still here, but the committees uh, had been staffed a good part of the time by patronage. And sometimes it was very effective and sometimes it wasn't. But, you know, the, if it was, maybe it still is, <laughs> they had a political agenda and uh, which was pri which was a priority. But uh, I think that those are the are the most significant things that have happened. At the time the wings were built, in fact, Senator Bow had planned to keep this office because it's so convenient. And then he decided that it would be better for him to be over in the wings where he had more contact with the members. 
And uh, so at that time, uh, and my office, you know, became larger because uh, of the additional space that we got when the lounge was was divided. And so uh, we had, and we had room for uh, more of the equipment and more files that we needed in there. And so it, w it was very nice. It was very workable. We had a purple refrigerator. And I don't know whether it's still there or not. Oh, I'm sure it was, but uh, because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't next door. But I got along fine. And Cinder Bow was very, uh, always very welcoming to Cecil. And so Cecil had good access, as well as, uh, as the other Senate presidents, particularly John Kitzhaber, too. And of course, Fred Hurd, and who else was it? Fadley. But it was, it was affected, but not nearly as easy. Well, not during session, no. We, we had the same. We had a calendar clerk and a journal clerk and an assistant secretary. And uh, I had a secretary. And then we had what I called an agenda clerk. And at that time, uh, we started recording the session in the back office. And that was more for a backup for us than any official record. But it was a good backup, and it was a good way for the, and, and, and the office was wired so that there was a speaker and, and they could hear the proceedings on the floor. But it was a real help to us. And then during the interim, I had uh, what amounted to a full-time secretary, a little more than full-time, and Donna, and Judy uh, split the position and each worked three days a week. And that worked out for them, they liked it. But then when uh, we would meet for executive appointments, sometimes I'd call in an extra person or we'd take one of the committee staff, whatever, whatever happened. But that was the extent of my staff. The official record is the journal. <laughs> and we kept an original journal at that time, which they don't do now but they keep, keep all of the documents. And we'd have to file that original journal with the Secretary of State. And maybe that's still done, I'm not sure. Well, I will try to relate what I remember as the duties of the Secretary of the Senate. And I'm sure the job description has probably been expanded since I was there. But first of all, the Secretary of the Senate is the parliamentarian. She interprets the Senate rules. When the rules don't apply, don't fit any particular situation, Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure was the authority that we went to. Also, the Secretary of the Senate supervises the floor staff and the clerical staff that's on the desk. I don't think they're called clerks anymore. They're probably an executive assistant of some sort. <laughs> but anyway, they were the journal clerk, the calendar clerk, the assistant secretary, and the reading clerk were the, the members on the, uh, were the employees on the desk. Also, one of the daily uh, duties that we performed is to compile the agenda for the session. And that becomes complicated at times. Of course, during the first of the session, it's pretty simple because there isn't that much controversy and uh, the bills come in, they're introduced and referred to a committee. Further on down the session, uh, there are uh, bills coming over from the House, bills coming out of committee, and uh, then debate ensues. So uh, the rules have to be uh, followed very precisely. That agenda has to uh, include all of the uh, motions and the bills that come before the Senate. Sometimes some extra things come up and we take care of them at the time and hope we do it. 
not hope we do it right. We do do it right, but uh, and always following the rules. By the time that I was Secretary of the Senate, there were the Democratic Party had a caucus and the Republican Party had a caucus. And if something really controversial was coming up, the party parties would caucus prior to the session and pretty well work them out. We did have some controversies right now. I can't recall any, but uh, they were handled without too much fuss and nothing was embarrassing for the Senate. During the interim, of course, we were busy compiling the records from the Senate, getting the journal and the calendar, which is now called Major Status, I think, published. That was a big chore. And uh, interim committees were functioning. We tried to help them as much as we could. And uh, orientation, I participated to a degree, but the caucuses did a lot, a lot of the orientation of their, of of the members and also, well, we did the staff and tried to uh, let them know the procedures on the floor and how many staff members were permitted on the floor. That didn't always hold, but we made every effort to do that. We, became, we w tried to build a relationship with the committee staff as well as the personal staff so that they would feel free to come to us for help if they needed it. And of course, we had oral roll call. You know, the reading clerk called the roll, and we all had our roll call slips where we kept the tally as well. And um, if we didn't agree, then we made sure that we were that we had the correct vote. We didn't have any of the equipment that's that's up here now, and it all worked. One of the first things. I think that a legislator has to keep in mind is that for a bill to pass, there needs to be consensus and compromise. And one way to do that is to get to know the members, your members, and to establish relationships with them so that you can come, so that a compromise and consensus can come about. And of course, it goes without saying, they have to know the bills and study them and know what's on the calendar and what's up in the Senate proceedings. And sometimes at the end of the session, things get kind of hectic, so with all the staff they have, with this, not all the staff, but with the help of their staff, they can keep abreast of what's coming up. But I think those are the most important things. Well, you have to be loyal to your legislator or to the person you're working for because uh, there are a lot of forces at work. And uh, as for personal staff, you need, of course, the usual skills. And you have to know, you have to become really knowledgeable on the Senate rules and the procedures of whichever house you're working for. Well, it's the third branch of government equal to both the executive and judicial, and it's the voice of the people, which I, felt, which I feel is the most important. That was an interesting session because, uh, you know, I don't want to say animosity, but the Democrats were not happy, just were not happy. and. Uh, and Senator Lent was just, I think he was heartbroken. He became a very good friend of mine, uh, you know, in the later years. We had a coffee group downstairs that met at 8 o'clock, and he was always there, and uh, he was a justice at that time and was fun. And he was the one. Uh, who always swore me in as Secretary of the Senate, which was a really nice gesture on his part to be able to come over and do that. One time, and I don't know whether it was on this 18-year-old vote 
18-year-old vote thing or when Senator Burns was elected president. But anyway, we couldn't get a quorum. The Democrats left. Nobody knew where they were. And it took several days to find them. And they were over at Senator Burbage's house, which is, I don't know, not very far from here, I don't think. But Senator Burbage was very active in the Democratic Party. And so all the Democrats were over there. And finally, someone got a hold of them. I don't, Sergeant at Arms or somebody. And, and they got them back here. But, uh, you know, here we'd come to work ready to go and couldn't get a quorum. So <laughs> we'd go on to the next day. But, uh, you know, we managed. We managed. And the, uh, the process works, which I think is, is, uh, is shows how important it is. And the sergeant at arms at that time was Vern Drager, big fat guy from Portland. He exhibited authority. <laughs> and so he went out and got them. And uh, they all came back and then we went from there. And somehow the session, we got through and it ended. And during that session, you know, one important bill that passed was combining all these agencies into the Human Resources Department. And that was a big thing. Of course, Governor McCall was right there. I think a lot of people take credit for it now who maybe didn't play as major a role as they would have liked to. Uh, Paul Hanneman was, uh, he was a representative from t over at Pacific City. He was active in it. And then in a later session, and I don't remember, maybe it was the Beach Bill. It was Sid Bassett from Grants Pass who helped get the, the Beach Bill through. But as for the debate, you know, I can't remember. And when you're working back in the Secretary of the Senate's office, you don't really have time to listen to all the debate. You're busy getting ready for whatever's coming up next. I should have read the papers more diligently than I did, or paid more close attention. Like I say, some of these things just come back. The beach bill, the bottle bill, taxes and education. <laughs> I wouldn't consider it a challenge, but it was something that I tried very hard to do, and that was to uh, work with the different, I, I can't call them agencies necessarily, but with the people involved with the work from the desk. First of all, was engrossed in enrolled bills. We worked very closely with them. We worked very closely with the printer. And, uh, and of course, with uh, council before session in, in, draft, in the bill drafts. So I tried to have the desk operate in a way that uh, met their needs as expeditiously as we could. Because as soon as we get through with reading a committee report or acting on a bill, it goes to another department, and that is where their work begins. And engrossed in rolled bills at that time was not probably as sophisticated as it is now, but uh, you know they were here late at night getting these amendments over to the printer so we could have them the next day. And so it was just imperative that we keep, keep good communication and get our material down there as quickly as we could. And of course, to keep a happy group, mm -hmm. <laughs> keep the pages happy and out of mischief, <laughs> and uh, the floor staff and all of that. One year, and I don't remember which one it was, but uh, we had students from the deaf school, and uh, two of them. And they taught the rest of the pages all this sign language, of course, which nobody else knew. And it's probably a good thing. <laughs>
but they would sit there and work their hands, you know, and, and you'd see this smile come on their face, and we knew it was something we didn't need to know. <laughs> But they were fun. We had, had good page staff. One thing that uh, was so impressive to me when I first started to work, and, and all the time that I was working, really, most of the time I was working, was the emphasis on dress code and decorum. I mean, when I started to work, the members all were in suits and ties, and it was formal. And of course, the employees dressed in the same manner. And as we got into the later years, that was not the case. And I thought it was a shame, because uh, I guess I'd been brought up that, you know, you show a certain amount of respect for the position that you're holding and for the organization that you're working for. And I understand now that they're coming back into emphasis on decorum and dress code, and I'm so happy to hear it. And I think it, it makes, makes for better work. You do better when you're, when you're dressed up. You do a better job. That may be uh, just my f feeling, but uh, I think your behavior is different, and uh, that uh, it just it just lends itself to a better operation. Regarding the personal staff, and uh, something that you should be aware of is that while there are regular hours, in my case it was eight to five most of the time. But when the legislature is in session, you need to be here. And um, sometimes that's late at night. Sometimes it's all day, particularly toward the end of the session. And as to when the legislature adjourns, there's no way to predict it. You just go along with it. And sometimes it takes longer than others, as you've experienced in years past. The one session that I remember that took forever, it seemed like, was uh, when Fred Hurd was president. We went to work at 8 that morning, and we finished at 6 a.m. the following day, and we were here all that time. That was the first time I'd ever been at work that long. It was grueling, and uh, we made it. and. Uh, Thank heaven we didn't have to, that I didn't have to do it again. There's arguments both ways, but uh, to me the state and the state government has become so much larger and more involved that uh, to meet every two years just doesn't seem practical. And I don't know how many other states meet every two years, but it can't be very many. And I think this idea of having a short session in the odd year, is a, in the off year, is a good one. We'll see how it works. I hope so. Another thing that's come about, and it started in my last years, was the increase in the number of members on the emergency board. You know, it used to only be six or seven from each house. And now, I don't know how many it is, but there's a lot more. And I wonder, will the emergency board continue to operate as it does with this, this session in the off year? I don't know. I've been busy. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, after I retired, my husband became very ill. and. Uh, that took a good part of my time. He passed away in 1991. And since then, I've been traveling and keeping up with my grandchildren. I do a little bit of volunteer work, but uh, keeping up with my family and traveling is mostly what I've done. And I try to keep in touch with people up here because it was such a big and wonderful part of my life.